on February the 19th, 19, uh, 1992, Lillian Margaret Cleveland was baptized at that font. And one year ago, we commissioned Lillian as a young adult volunteer in mission to serve in Nashville, Tennessee. Lillian is the third person from this congregation to be a young adult volunteer. Her predecessors were Kelly Haupt and Thomas Guthrie, who is in worship with us this morning. Next week, Lillian will complete her term of service at a meeting in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. And then she is off to the Ivory Coast, where she will join her mother Peggy and her sister Abigail, who will no doubt be glad to see her, for she is the French speaker in the family, and this is a French-speaking country. I've asked Lillian to give us uh, a report and a, a kind of sharing of her experience as a young adult volunteer in mission. I think this is a grand thing to do. I much prefer that she would give us an explanation of that bit about bridling the tongue and how the tongue is uh, such a dangerous thing, but we'll let her do that another time. Uh, this will uh, take the sermon time. You can call it a sermon. Uh, you can call it sharing, but I have every confidence you will hear God's word in it. So Lillian. I'm a little nervous, but it's going to be good. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so for the past year, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, where I served as a young adult volunteer. The Young Adult Volunteer Program is a service year program through the Presbyterian Church USA. The young Adult Volunteers, or YAVs for short, live in intentional community while working with nonprofits in the community in which they live. There are many sites, both nationally and internationally. YAV focuses on simple living, vocational discernment, intentional community, cross-cultural mission, and faith in action. I lived with four other women and we all worked at various nonprofits throughout Nashville. We lived together and had weekly meetings to talk about our jobs, our lives, and the communities that we were building for ourselves. Two of my roommates worked with those experiencing homelessness. One worked with refugees, and one worked with Latino immigrants and the Latino population in Nashville. I worked with high schoolers. I worked at a place called the Martha O'Brien Center. Martha O'Brien Center works with the individuals and families that live in East Nashville, and it partners with other organizations around Nashville to help empower this community. Martha O'Brien Center was started in 1894 and in 1948 moved to its current location next to an area called Casey Place. Casey Place is the oldest and largest public housing development in Nashville. It's also one of the poorest with an average income of around $6,000. 89% of these households are led by a single woman. East Nashville in general is more economically disadvantaged than the rest of Nashville. This area of the city is geographically isolated from the rest of the city because it is on the other side of the Cumberland River. You have to cross the bridge to get over there and historically the transportation did not always go over to that side of town. Because of this, many of the residents of East Nashville live in poverty and do not have the same opportunities and resources as those who live in the other areas of the city. The main focus of the Martha O'Brien Center is to alleviate and hopefully one day eliminate poverty. They work with people of all ages and strive to work with people through each part of, part of their lives, starting with toddlers all the way to the elderly population. They focus on education and employment opportunities in order to help people move out of poverty. I worked with Martha O'Brien's high school program. I worked at a high school located in East Nashville that partners with Martha O'Brien in order to raise the graduation rate, increase interest and opportunity for post-secondary education, and to allow for a space for mentoring and tutoring opportunities for these high schoolers. The graduation rate at this high school, as well as many of the public high schools in Nashville, is low. Many of these students will be first-generation college students if they continue on to post-secondary education. During the day, I worked with the senior class. I met with individual students and helped them come up with a plan for after graduation. 
I gave presentations to classes of all ages about the importance of going to college and what resources were available, for, available to them for continuing their education after high school. We wanted to encourage all students to have a plan for after graduation, whether that was going to college, getting a job, or joining the military. I worked mostly with the students who were interested in going on to some type of post-secondary education, technical schools, community colleges, and four-year universities. I helped them with college applications, the FAFSA, which is financial, financial aid, scholarship applications, and just gave general advice about how college would differ from their high school experience. After school, we had a tutoring program called the College Zone, where I worked with high schoolers in all of the grades. We had homework and tutoring time, followed by different activities like healthy cooking, art class, hip hop dance, lots of things similar to that. This high school did not have many clubs, and we were there to provide different clubs and activities that the students could be involved in. It took me a few months at this job to realize that for my students, being at school was saving a lot of these kids. Often my students would tell me about things happening in their lives, and I would wonder how they even managed to show up to school that day. But then I realized that they came to school because it was one of the only constant things in their lives. When I was 17, I had a job so that I could have extra spending money. I knew that my family always had enough money to feed us, and I knew that after graduation, I would attend college like the majority of my peers. I really only knew how to survive if that were the plan. However, for the students I worked with, their lives at 17 were, were very different than mine. They only knew how to survive if they didn't go to college. They knew how to navigate the bus system to get anywhere they needed to go in Nashville. They knew how to get a job in order to help their parents with their bills. They knew that they couldn't necessarily fail a grade because it's not entirely possible in metro public schools, so they knew which homework they had to do and which they didn't. They knew how to find a place to live when they couldn't live at home anymore. They knew how to survive in a world that has a lot stacked against them, but they didn't know how to apply for college. One day, after I'd been working there for just a few weeks, my supervisor asked me if I would sit and talk with a student for a little bit. I was nervous because I didn't know what the student needed to talk about and I had never met this student before. He was frustrated because of different situations going on at home. He was struggling with his identity and didn't know how to explain to his mother what was happening. He knew that his family was struggling financially and wanted to help, but he was only 15 and couldn't find a job. I sat and listened to this student tell me his frustrations and thoughts for about 30 or 40 minutes. I didn't respond often, mostly just listened. At first I felt myself wanting to respond to come up with the perfect response to make this student feel better. However, what he really needed was for someone to listen to him, and that I could do. After that day, he made a point to speak to me every day. He was the first of many students who shared his story with me. I spent a lot of time at my job just listening and talking to students to get to know them. I learned who they were and what their lives were like. Little by little, these students let me into their lives. We had two students that came to College Zone every day. They often didn't have a ton of homework to do, which was actually typical for most of our students. However, we didn't turn students away. Whether they needed a place to be after school, needed actual tutoring help, or just wanted to be with their friends, all were welcome. However, they also knew the expectations and that the rule was during our one and a half hour work time, you had to be working on something. We were very lenient with that rule. Sometimes it meant you were actually doing your homework. Sometimes it meant you were pretending to look at your homework on the computer. Sometimes it meant you were pretending to read a book that was given to you by one of the tutors. These two boys did not like to do work and did not like to be quiet during work time, which meant they were mostly spending their time distracting other students. One day, at a particularly after a particularly frustrating day, my supervisor told these students that they had to leave for the rest of the day, which meant that they had to ride the public bus instead of the bus that we provided. One of the boys did not like that response and was very annoyed that he was being asked to leave. He did leave, but yelled some not so kind words at us as he was leaving. However, he came back the next day. He was there, mostly behaved, and eventually apologized to us. More importantly, we were all there again the next day, welcoming him back. 
Each day is a new day. Every day there were new challenges and frustrations and new students, but we showed up every day. Every day we were there to greet students, welcome them into this community, try to help them do their homework, and just to be there in general for our students. We continued to show up and so did our students. That constant presence was very important. We weren't always successful in getting students to complete work or even to sit down on some days, but we were always there day after day. Community is important and necessary. Humans are not meant to live in isolation. Humans are meant to live with others in community. I was expecting to form a community with my fellow Yavs, and I did. I was expecting, for the most part, to form a community with those I worshiped with, and I did. I was hoping, but maybe not expecting, to form a community with the people that I worked with, and I did. My supervisor and coworkers welcomed me with open arms. My supervisor listened to my concerns and suggestions with an open mind. We supported each other in ways that became more apparent as the year went on. However, I wasn't necessarily expecting to form a community with the students that I worked with, but my students welcomed me into their community and I couldn't have been more appreciative. Living life with others is hard. It's wonderful and life-giving and important, but it's really hard. It's easy to live life with others when everything is going well. It's a lot harder to be there for others during the more difficult times. But that's just as important, if not more important, than being there during the easier times. It was easy for me to celebrate with a student when they got an acceptance letter for a college, made the score they needed on the ACT, or got a job. It was a lot harder when a student came in and talked about having to get a job in order to help their student or help their family pay the bills. Or when a student told me that she didn't go outside in her neighborhood because you never knew when there would be a shooting. Or when a student told me he didn't know how to reconcile wanting a family and knowing that he identified as gay. It was hard when my roommates told similar stories about the people that they were working with and the daily frustrations that we all dealt with. We all worked with people who, in a sense, were living their life in a crisis mode. Hospitality, however, was everywhere during my Yav year. I saw it in the teenagers who welcomed me into their high school. I saw it in the families who invited my roommates and I to different meals. I saw it in the preschoolers that I taught Sunday school to. I was living a somewhat transient life during my year. However, over and over again, people invited me into their lives. They asked me what I was doing and listened to me tell stories about my work. They brought up all of us to events around Nashville that we probably couldn't have afforded otherwise. They shared meals with us. One of my roommates from the past year has an entire philosophy built around how important food, hospitality, community, and faith are. She would probably be able to articulate this better, but I came up with what she kind of says. Her main idea is that food brings people together. Now, I kind of already knew this because I grew up in the South. However, she is from California, and her first time in the South was when she moved to Nashville. She said that anything and everything can be shared around a table with a meal. She said, every time you share a meal with someone, you let them into your life in the best way possible. Food and the hospitality involved in serving or receiving a meal can help build community. In most YAV sites, YAVs all share one house together. However, the way things worked in Nashville, we actually lived in two different houses. In order to be intentional about the community we were creating, we decided to do weekly dinners. One week, my house would cook, and the other house would come to our house, and the next week, they would cook, and we would go over there. This became a time for us to share stories and be together without any other distractions, just the five of us. It helped us to create our own community. Jesus welcomed people to his table, which taught us that we should welcome people to ours. Strangers, friends, family, all are welcome at his table, and all should be welcome at our table. I learned a lot of lessons during my Yav year, and I don't even think that I can articulate all the lessons that I learned yet. But I hope that I'll be able to carry on these lessons throughout my life. I learned even more so who I want to be and how I want to live out my life. I learned how to articulate my faith while also recognizing the injustices that exist in the world. 
I learned how to grapple with big issues and how to reconcile what I believed in with what I saw happening in the world. I learned that everyone has a story to tell. I learned that invalidating others' experiences only further isolates the minority. I learned that living life with others means learning which battles are worth fighting. I learned that sometimes all you can do is continue to show up every day. I learned that community is important because humans are not made to be isolated. I learned that hospitality and community go together. I learned that you can't fix everything in a day, a month, or even a year. I was a French major in college with a minor in poverty studies. Often when I tell people this, I get the inevitable, inevitable question, well, what are you going to do with that? Depending on the tone of the question, I can tell whether that person is genuinely curious or just shocked that I chose, in their minds, a useless major. <laughs> the end of our year, yeah, like the end of college, was a time of transition. Towards the end of our Yavir, one of my roommates read us a story about people in times of transition that ended with a quote that has stuck with me. It's how I will now respond when asked about my major, my Yavir, and probably one day my career choice. The quote was aimed towards college seniors who were English majors and how to respond when people ask them, what are you going to do with that? The response was simple, carry it with me as I do with everything that matters. I don't know how this past year and all of my experiences will continue to shape me, but I know that it will. And I know that I will carry it with me like everything that matters. And for that, I am very grateful.